Hey, hey everyone, it is Sleepy Reader, AKA Damien. This is another one of my super subjective comic book countdowns where I share my comic book thoughts with you. Share my comic book thoughts with you while I count down the 11 comics I got this past Wednesday, September 15th. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and I'd say if there was any pattern to it, it was that for whatever reason this week I was enjoying stuff that was less familiar to me. Um, the the more different it was, somehow the more I liked it, uh, at least in some cases. I mean, all of this is subjective and, and my little uh, comic book diary. Um, but anyway, uh, let me do the countdown for you. Uh, let's get see if I can work work out how to be fancy here on OBS. I've seen some people where there's just a little circle or just there. Maybe they're using a green screen or something. But anyway, uh, this is the best I can do. Uh, let's see, make myself smaller, make the comics bigger. So in at number 11, I should also say that I there were no clunkers this week in my pile. I enjoyed every comic I got. So even the one that came in, in quote, last place was a perfectly good comic. I'm not dropping it or anything. Um, time before time, I guess this is the end of an arc. It didn't really feel like that. Um, I'm loving the art more and more. I don't know if the artist is, uh, the artist is um, Joe Palmer and uh, with art, with colors by Chris O'Halloran. But I feel like I'm grooving on the art and colors even more than I have been. And um, the story, you know, the, the reason it's number 11 is I like the story, but I'm, I'm somehow feeling kind of distanced from it. I'm not sure quite why. Um, it looks like, uh, to spoil things a little bit, it looks like maybe if I understood what, what we saw this time around, that maybe our hero is the one that in the end may have been screwed over his friend who we know ended up like a sickly old man last we saw him but in this issue we see him again and he uh i believe if i understand correctly he steals the better time machine that his friend is using and keeps it for himself um so maybe that uh less good time machine that he left his friend with here are the two time machines uh maybe that's the cause of the friend's health issues. It's hard to believe this is a time machine at all. Um, but anyway, yeah, somehow it's uh, it's a fun but not 100% engaging comic for me compared to the others. Also very good and actually had some <clears throat> qualities that were really exciting to me, <clears throat> but also maybe some issues that uh, that kept nagging at me the, the main issue being the art, like, is the art just totally a bunch of manipulated photographs? Or is there actual drawing art in here? And is that picky of me that I feel like a comic shouldn't just be manipulated photos, no matter how well it's done? You know, maybe I should just accept that. Um, I used to think Sorrentino was using a combination of photos and his actual art. But there's a few pages in this that are clearly drawn, which makes me think the rest of them are just photos. Although it seems like a lot of work like to get this character, or someone who looks like this, to pose, because that's our main character there. He's a recent PhD from MIT who's been hired by NASA that's closing down in this alternate universe. I've uh, been hired by them to just sort of go through their materials before they shut NASA down completely shut the space program down completely to see if there's anything of uh, defense department value there. So the thing that that uh, is exciting about Sorrentino's artwork is all the fun ways he plays with layouts. And the colors are pretty nifty too, although the, I think the colors are Dave Stewart. Yeah, the colors are Dave Stewart. So, um, you know, I, I really dig all of this, but at the same time, I'm... I, I let it bother me. I kept looking at this and saying, are these photographs? Are these photographs? So that kind of, that hang up of mine kind of made me enjoy this less. Um, was I 
is is this comic in a sense fumetti as they used to call it a comic that was just pictures with some word balloons photographs with, with some word balloons added on um, and in this case manipulated and then recolored by a professional colorist um, I'll show you the look, I mean this is incredible stuff right it I, I shouldn't be fussing over it um, but I'll show you the one point oh and I love that page there too the one point that um, these are clearly drawings, right? And they're so different from the rest that it makes me think this is actually what Sorrentino's drawings look like, which are perfectly fine, and the rest is all just made for photographs. So I I don't know. Somehow that just got under my skin. I, I have to say that um, that maybe so far this is... It's not engaging on a character level. It's more, uh, it almost feels more like a Jonathan Hickman book than a, than a, um, than a Jeff Lemire book on that level um, so far. But I enjoyed it, and I'm looking forward to reading more of it. So that was in at number 10. In at number 9 was Fantastic Four Life Story. I think I have not been loving Fantastic Four Life Story, and of the four issues that have come out so far, I like this one the best, maybe because its focus was on Ben Grimm, The Thing, although I still feel like Mark Russell, the writer, who's a writer that I often like a lot, uh, perhaps doesn't grasp the characters that well from the Fantastic Four. Um, but he does, he has created kind of an interesting portrait of a version of Ben Grimm, The Thing here. And uh, I love this cover, which is not done by the interior artist, but this is, this might be my cover of the week. I'm not sure if I did a cover of the week. Um, the cover was by Daniel, Daniel Acuna, who I know is a good artist, but I can't remember what I've seen him on before. Um, the main artist in here is Sean Izaxi, Izaxi? I don't know. With Francesco Mana. So I assume Francesco Mana is either an inker or an inking assist. One thing, I, I'm not crazy about Izaki's art, but I actually think he does a really good Ben Grimm, the thing. Um, and I, maybe the art and coloring has grown on me a bit, a bit in this issue compared to previous issues. But there's a, there's a whole bunch of stuff about the thing's uh, dating life. And then in the background, we kind of have the coming of Galactus, the preparations for that. And it looks like maybe Sue and Reed will get back together or maybe not. Um, but then, I don't want to totally spoil it, but the Silver Surfer arrives. And uh, I don't think this is spoiling anything. He, he says Galactus is coming in 10 years. So because this skips decades, that'll mean in 10 years uh, we'll have our story about Galactus. There was a long sort of side story about Ben Grimm as a pilot in Korea. And while I have nothing against the kind of anti-war um, situation, which seemed highly believable uh, that, uh, that Mark Russell created for Ben Grimm, it just, I don't know, it just didn't seem to quite fit into the story or into Ben Grimm's personality maybe part of Russell's rewriting of Ben Grimm's personality, but it just didn't quite click for me. And as you can, that was like at least, it was a four or five pages um, in a in an issue that's supposed to cover an entire decade. We got a four or five page uh, flashback to the 1950s. Anyway, it was okay. So I ranked this in at number nine. Um, I enjoyed it, but I quibble with it like crazy. This uh, Snelson comedy is dead. I enjoy. Um, it makes me a bit uncomfortable. I don't like I read the first issue and I kind of thought like, oh, I've got the whole story. I, it didn't feel like there was a, a more story to come, um, I guess, except Snelson got cancer. Uh so anyway, uh, in this issue, the main focus is kind of spoofing a um, a podcast, you know, where a almost washed up comedian starts his own podcast and revives his career. And that seems to be what's going on here. And a lot of 
playing back and forth between like there's a YouTuber who makes YouTube documentaries about people who have been canceled. There's a reporter who, you know, the, you, we get different voices on different political sides of very current kinds of issues. And it, it made me kind of uncomfortable and angry. And <laughs> I, I don't like either side in a way, uh, um, which is probably the case of how the writer feels too. The, and the writer's kind of, you know, where's the balance in things? Where do we find the proper middle ground where everyone can have their voice um, without, I don't know, pushing things so far? <laughs> this is... This is quite the scene where the woman is uh, wiping her nose. Anyway, crazy book. Uh, I, can't, I I pretty much enjoyed it because I enjoyed all of these. Um, uh, left me a bit like, uh, I just, it, it, I did like a lot that this, this is like no other comic. Uh, if, if anything, it, it harkens back to maybe a more serious underground comic that's trying to talk about the issues of the day or something like that. So Ahoy does really interesting comics. The next comic up is um, Second Coming, Only Begotten Son, number five. But I got number four at the same time. Apparently I missed it last month, or my comic shop missed getting it. And so that they, uh, they were both, were they both in my box or one was in my box and I had to pick the other up off the rack. Um, this is very similar to Snelson in a sense, is a, co a comic book that uh, doesn't have a traditional story shape to it anymore, and it's tackling all kinds of hot-button issues, mostly about religion, as, as you might expect. And in issue five, we literally go visit heaven. And um, I guess it's quite daring. I mean, as I was mentioning on... Uh, on the uh, weekly Sunday comic book chat with uh, La Rasa and Comic Crack and uh, and Earl Grey, I feel like our biggest taboo in the U.S. is talking too closely about religion and uh, too heavy-duty criticism of religion. But anyway, uh, in this second series is mostly kind of a pro-Jesus series. Uh I don't think it would be as offensive as the first series of Only Begotten, of Second Coming was, um, which was not terribly offensive, but I I wasn't too thrilled about their portrayal of God. The portrayal of Jesus was okay, but the portrayal of God kind of irked me. But anyway, um, I don't have a lot of investment uh, in any form of organized religion, so none of it, any kind of criticism or a uh, different point of view people want to have on these things. It's fine with me with them expressing them. It's just an unusual experience seeing it in a comic. And while I mostly like, you know, personally think that um, particularly in the second volume, the portrayal of Jesus was kind of nice. Um, I find the portrayal of heaven just kind of random, you know. Okay, so this is what at the moment uh, Mark Russell imagines heaven's like, but I don't really see. Uh, I don't see the clever philosophical questions there, as opposed to his portrayals of of uh, of Jesus on Earth. Actually, the second coming of Jesus. I actually liked the sunspot parts a lot, where sunspots trying to. Uh, be more of a man of the people and take rec uh, requests and stuff from people, suggestions. But um, and and that had some interesting interesting stuff about superheroes going on in it. And also uh, another thing I like a lot is uh, the art by I think his name is Richard. Yeah, Richard Pace. Well, Richard Pace and Leonard Kirk together because it's layouts and finishes. And the the art looks very nice. The color uh, is by Andy Troy. And it's very good coloring for this kind of superhero story <laughs> uh, or God and superheroes kind of story. But anyway, so it's it's a visually very pleasing comic, both these issues. I feel like uh, the art team, I don't know if it's, I think it's roughly the same art team as in the first volume. But anyway, they've got they just keep getting better and better. Um so it's an it's it's hard to recommend this to other people, but it 
and it'll never be my favorite comic, I think, but it's always kind of interesting. It's I, I heard on a podcast that uh, if he gets the opportunity, the writer, Mark Russell, would like to do four volumes of this second coming book, which surprised me because it feels like already on this second volume, it's a bit plotless. It's like, oh, uh, let's... Let's talk about uh, a Christian amusement park here. Oh, let's talk here about uh, uh, what people expect from a superhero. Oh, over here, let's talk about uh, what heaven would be like and whether it would match different people's expectations. All interesting little tidbits, but not feeling like they fit into a big master plan. Okay, that was at number seven. At number six, I kind of loved... Uh, Fantastic Four, the 60 years anniversary edition. The weird thing is I'm, I'm from all of my looking into it, I didn't look into it for this, but I have in the past for other reasons. Uh, Fantastic Four number one came out 60 years ago, August. But this is, this came out in the middle of September. So I don't know what the story is there. Maybe production was too tricky, but in this modern age of counting everything exactly, I kind of wanted this to co- this 60th anniversary issue to come out on the very same day that uh, the Fantastic Four number one came out, which I think was sometime in early August 1961. What? Well, two reasons I that I remember that is because I realized that my very first Marvel comic and my first comic that I can remember, I bought in early August of 1971. So I literally started reading comics on the 10th anniversary of Marvel Comics. Not the Fantastic Four, but an issue of the Avengers that had some scrolls pretending to be the Fantastic Four in it. Um, I don't know if that if they were even marking the 10th anniversary mentally then. Um, so I've been reading the Fantastic Four and other Marvel comics on and off for 50 years out of the 60. And I was born July 30th, 1961. So about a week or two before the first issue of, uh, Fantastic Four number one, which is another reason why I remember that factoid, um, so essentially, I am the exact same age as the Marvel Universe, for better or worse. Um, this marked the return, I believe, of John Romita Jr. to the Marvel Universe also. Um, and he puts he brings, with Dan Slott, does a really long story about Fantastic Four and all these iterations of Kang the Conqueror. And I really enjoyed it, and I sometimes do not like JRJR's artwork these days. But I thought for the most part he did a very good job. I love all the kind of line work and such. And for the most part, the colorist didn't cover up the line work too much. Um, the, d- the designs, the sense of uh, the shapes of the different versions of Kang and the architecture and everything, I just thought it was all very cool. Um, so that gave me a lot of pleasure. And then this comic had a clever conceit from Dan Slott that it was made up of uh, four stories of told by the different Kangs about their supposed defeat of the Fantastic Four, um, each one with a cover. And the first cover is a 12-cent cover. It doesn't look fully like covers looked like back then, but, but you know, it's still fun. It's got that... Uh, box up there and everything let's see if i can find the next cover but anyway you can see the artwork here i've heard some people really complaining about his artwork even in this issue which i thought was quite good there's the next one which looks like it's from the early 90s already so they skipped way ahead they didn't try to have a cover for each decade which would have been fun but but still it was kind of a fun conceit um there's uh this must be from the early 2000s. And then I think the final cover is from the, ooh, that's a, that's a really cool um, sequence there, is from the, uh, it's 499, so it's supposed to be a, ma- a current cover. Although with this kind of fantastic, kind of harkens back to some older covers actually, the way the, 
you don't often see someone like crushing the logo on the cover, but I feel like that used to happen. It is confusing when their ads are also covers. So for a second, it looks like these are just two ads. And then you realize this is yet another cover. They all say issue 35, um, legacy issue 680. Anyway, that was really fun. And um, the twist in the story was good enough. Uh, and so I enjoyed it. I, I read one other recent Fantastic Four digitally. I'm almost tempted to jump back on. If it were JRJR continuing here, I think I would uh, continue with it physically. But I think uh, it doesn't come out as good. It looks better on the paper than digitally here which is unusual, but I really like that face there. But I think that JRJR is moving on to a Spider-Man project. I'm not sure. But so this was nice It it because I have loved the Fantastic Four since 1971 for 50 years. And uh, this was a nice homecoming <laughs> to the Fantastic Four for me. But ironically, as much as I love that, I did not go ahead. I have not read the other stories. There's kind of a cartoony story here, which seems to be, you know, at first glance, I almost expected it to be selling a hostess cupcake or something. But it seems to, just from the look of it, to hark back to their first uh, battle with the Mole Man. And then there's this other story. Um, is it by Mark Wade? I think it's by Mark Wade. The credits are elsewhere. Um, but I believe it's a retelling of the Fantastic Four's origin. So I haven't got, I wasn't in the mood to read those yet. But still, I really like this issue. I am, I have no, I used to have about 40% DC in my pull and a smattering of Marvel. Now I have a slightly larger smattering of Marvel and mostly indies. But I'm getting tempted to pick up more Mar Marvel comics. Um, I have Marvel Unlimited. So I'm, as the wise thing to do would be just to keep reading things there. Um, so that was at number six, and that was very good, but things keep getting better. I am really, really enjoying uh, this, uh, I guess, final Jupiter's Legacy series called Requiem. Um, funny that it'd be a Requiem, because a Requiem would be kind of an, an end point, maybe where you sum up someone's life or something. <laughs> Uh, but really, this is full of revelations and I guess, you know, pushing the world of uh, flawed superheroes uh, further down the down the road and everything. But also bringing in revelations about alien worlds and with that also have superheroes and slowly we're getting some more information on the origin of the powers, the, the Jupiter's legacy, the legacy apparently from the planet Jupiter or thereabouts, maybe a moon of Jupiter. Um, the art is just fantastic by Tommy Lee Jones. I feel like if the comics field weren't so crowded and there was just so much going on, that this would be standout material that would, that would put Tommy Lee Jones into a sort of higher level of stardom. I do feel like the way... The way that Millar is scripting here, he's he's definitely thinking in terms of a, a long form TV show <laughs> that has a, a large cast and a certain amount of soap opera and the pacing and everything just feels like that, which is ironic since the show was canceled as a TV show. But he probably had it in his mind now that this he probably as he was scripting this was thinking that they were going to have a big long-running TV show on their hands, and he was scripting this comic like a long-running TV show with a large cast of characters and moving things a little bit forward for each character in each episode. Um, this art is fantastic. Uh, and Tommy Lee Jones is doing his own... Is it Tommy Lee Jones? Yeah, Tommy, Tommy Lee Edwards. Uh, Jones, Edwards. Sorry, Tommy Lee Edwards is doing his own coloring, uh, and he's really is integrate. It's not like lines versus color here. It's it's the color he's drawing with the color, and with lines to some degree. Um, and he's been well known as someone with a black and 
an intense black and white look. So, but he's was able to transfer over to this color technique wonderfully. So anyway, kind of uh, ironic when you think about it, but I'm super enjoying this. You know, in a week, week, <laughs> week or week, this could have been a number one comic for me. Um, another comic that can easily be a number one for me and maybe is just hurting. Uh, so that uh, Jupiter's Legacy was at number five. Yusagi Yojimbo, number 22. I'm putting it number four. Um, and the only thing hurting this, I think, is other comics that are now feeling uh, have more novelty for me. I think I was enjoying novelty this week. And after 22 issues of Usagi, it's dependably great, uh, great fun to read, uh, kind of maintains a certain level of character and plot and lightness and darkness. It's, it's kind of familiar at this point, but done very well. It's not like the plots are repeating, but the tone uh, is retained over time, and I guess so I put it at number four in a, of a very good week. In this one, we um, we get more of some characters that I think I've saw briefly who are who are who are very uh, rascally uh, thieves. and um, but it's played well. Uh, moving into the tension as uh, the thieving is going to end up involving involving Usagi and his uh, companion uh, in a lot of trouble. <laughs> it's it's interesting. We've got a rich world of competing uh, nobility, competing different uh, shoguns, I guess, or is that the wrong term? Lords of different kinds. But then different groups of criminal organizations in each village, it seems, too. And there's this one involves the criminal organization a lot. So anyway, enjoyed that quite a lot. Um, still not, not a lot new to say about Usagi, basically, for me. Great art, great coloring. Still colored by hi-fi design. Um, yeah, excellent stuff. In at number three is Savage Hearts, number three. Nothing really new to say about this. I've been loving this Savage Hearts thing. It's, it's hilarious. It's a lot of fun in a kind of uh, fantasy world that with a lot of sense of humor, but a lot of color and a lot of action. Uh, wonderfully paced, wonderful art, wonderful colors. Um, on the garish side, on purpose, I think, by Laverne Kinderzyski, the colorist. Um, but yeah, it looks great. It's fun to read. It's easy to read. And, uh, the characters just jump off the page at you. So a very good comic. I don't know if there's only one more issue. I'll be sad, but the typical dark horse miniseries now is just four issues. I assume that's to save them money. We also got a city on a turtle in this issue. Let's see. There's the turtle city. Yeah, so cool stuff. You know, not for everyone probably you want, have to be in the mood for this art and this sense of humor and the fantasy setting. You know, it's a specific kind of taste, I guess. Another, so the biggest novelty comic <laughs> of the week at in at number two is Mullet Cop, which I just grabbed off the shelf at I Like Comics, which I went to as kind of my backup store this week. And all of a sudden, they seem to have a lot of Scout comics. At I, not I like comics. I'm sorry, um, books with pictures, <laughs> which is just a mile and a half away from me. Um, so that I've been using them more often as my backup shop um, because they do get a good selection of indie comics, and they're getting a lot of Scout comics now. All of a sudden, which I'm not too familiar with. And I don't know if this is a one shot or really an ongoing, but it's, it's like, I'm not sure. I didn't count the pages or anything, but I think it's maybe two and a half times the size of a normal comic. And it's written and drawn by this one fellow and I assume colored Tom Lintern. And it's just this, I talked about it at length on the chat on Sunday, but it's just this kind of crazy 
pulpy, tongue-in-cheek world where most of civilization is in this mall, in this mega mall. And our hero is a mall cop. There's the mega mall. There's the destroyed city. Um, there's the foam bottling plant, whatever that is. And here's a biodome. Um, so anyway, uh, everything is told in a weird, humorous, tongue-in-cheek way as this cop gets a special assignment to try to take down gangs like these pink dolls by working in undercover in a buffet restaurant and he has a supercomputer in his microwave to help him solve crimes and the the art is very good it's kind of mobius a little bit um reminds me of some other things too but almost always the character's face is the same panel to panel la rasa did notice when i was showing it a few panels where he actually his face actually moves, and then there are there are some uh, profile pictures of him, but it's it's kind of disconcerting. It seems to be part of the joke of you know don't take this seriously. Um, yeah, same there, same there, but it it works somehow. <laughs> I don't know how they make it work. Um, so yeah, I, I don't even know how to how to describe this comic, but it was just kind of silly. These are these uh, women are his uh, co co workers as cops and under undercover cops at the restaurant. Um, there's there's the uh, the kitchen at the restaurant where they're working, <laughs> and it's it's just goofy, man. Um, so I don't know if there's f more issues, where, whether I'll get them or not. I picked it up basically because I, well, the title Mullet Cop was hilarious, and I loved the way this cover looked, the colors and the art style. So, And I looked up, and it, as far as I could tell, this artist, he has a career doing storyboards and commercial illustration, and this is his first comic, perhaps. And then my number one, another one I picked up without... Knowing anything about it, I picked it up at um, my backup shop there, um, Books with Pictures. And uh, it's called Porcelain. And I picked up, it's from Ablaze, the same people who do those European uh, Conan comics. And I have to assume this is a European comic too. It's by someone named Maria Lovett. I feel like I've heard that name somewhere. And uh, the copyright on it is like 2012 or something. And then the 2000. 221 2021 for the um ablaze version uh yeah to tw um 2012 so it's it's this wild story it has a bit of a vertigo comics feel in a way this young girl um who lives in this weird desert desert <laughs> locale ends up getting sucked into this uh, monstrous dollhouse. It's a bit like Red Riding Hood in the sense she was told by her aunt to stay on this path. And she uh, puts one foot off the path, and wham, the dollhouse swallows her. The art is really cool. It's a bit different from you know my, the usual fare I see, um, but cool colors, a cool style. Um, she doesn't use too many words. But there's enough. And um, and when I finished the first issue, I thought, oh, well, is it going to stay interesting in the second issue? Uh, but it did. Um, we get a different character, this girl who wears this kind of fox mask or something, who's who's been trapped in this dollhouse for a long time um, and says there's no way out, but it's going to help our heroine survive. Uh, her name isn't actually porcelain. I forget her name, but the the evil doll maker or whatever uh, says that she looks like she's made of porcelain, and maybe she'll she turns people into dolls, so they turns them into porcelain dolls, perhaps like that. Anyway, uh, as I often feel like I'm doing when I really like something that's different, I'm not. I don't have the right words. To explain it but um this was just a great pleasure both because it was different than anything i've read in a long time and 
it was really well executed looks really nice um it just it brings a different voice in some senses to my comic book reading while still i suppose being in familiar territory like i said it's a bit like a vertigo comic you could imagine this fitting in with sandman and that kind of thing um, in a line of comics so that was my that was my week in reading new comics. I read a lot of other comics. If you want, I'll try to remember to leave the link below to um, to the show where I was on. Um, oops, where I was on Earl Gray's channel, and uh, had a had a lot of fun chatting comics. I think the next chat will just be me and Rasa next Sunday. Uh, Probably on my channel, maybe on hers. I'm not sure which, but I, I think we said on mine. So anyway, uh, thanks for joining me, and I'll talk to you all later.